The GFC and digital revolution have forced unimagined, unimagined structural shifts onto Australia. So what do the next 10 years hold? Well, it's more of the same, more change and lots of it. Rebecca Nash spoke to some of those who make it their business to peek behind the curtains of the future. Tonight we'll attempt a bit of time travel. If you go forward to 2030 and look back, this was a period in which was a great change in the Australian economy. And as a consequence of that change, there were winners and losers. Bernard Salt says manufacturing, retailing, agriculture and tourism will be hardest hit. What we're actually seeing, I think, is the economic base that really provides an opportunity for low-skilled or unskilled workers. Those jobs are diminishing. The contraction of Australia's manufacturing began in the 60s. Once amounting to 30% of the country's economic activity, in 2012 it's down to 8%. In a short couple of years, it will lag health, professional and technical services. But manufacturing, I think, is consolidating down to probably what will be a fairly safe 5 or 6% of the economy. We'll still be making stuff, just not in the same way. Things like production lines in manufacturing will be significantly reduced due to things like robotics and uh, to 3D printing. In fact, there'll be few areas untouched by further advances in digital technology. There is going to be big changes in businesses like transport, uh, for instance, airlines due to virtual meetings. And we're going to see virtual meetings shift. They're not going to be like a Skype meeting now. It's going to be 3D. We've already learnt the impact of the digital revolution cannot be underestimated. Technology is the great uh, unknown unknown. Um, if you go back 10 years to 2002, no one had heard of the word uh, Facebook. Whatever those inventions are, whatever those developments are, it will make us more productive. In fact, Phil Ruffin believes the biggest growth in the Australian economy will be in communication and broadband industries. Australia has been way, way behind the developed world. Uh, in communications. I think even the antipathy towards fast broadband suggests that we might also, might almost be classed as uh, Neanderthals. For me, it's the same thing as a blast furnace was during the Industrial Revolution. You had to understand those kinds of capital intensive technologies in the Industrial Revolution. But it's what's in the ground which will still underpin the economy in 10 years, even though it won't be commanding the same prices. I think the strategic threat to Australia is not one of diminishing demand, but one of alternative sources, you know, whether it's Kazakhstan or whether it's Chile or whether it's Brazil. So today we're just going to be doing 3DS Max. Unsurprisingly, all agree flexibility and training are key in preparing for the coming changes. Educating our young people for jobs that don't exist yet is not really a big problem um, because, and I base this on my own personal experience, because I have a job that didn't exist when I went to school. Yeah. What's really critical is the continuous learning. What worries me most is we're in the fastest growing region of the world, being Asia. We more than ever uh, in this new 21st century uh, and being the Asian century, we have to get that long-term vision right. But Bernard Salt is heartened by the unprecedented interest from the private sector in preparing for the future. Even if what you think will happen in 2022 doesn't happen, going through the process, applying your mind, lifts you out of the here and now. And the role of any CEO, certainly the role of a board and the chairman of the board, is positioning. And as they say, position is everything. <laughs> Well, that's the vision. What about a more nuts and bolts appraisal of where we might be going over the next 10 years? BIS Shrapnel runs longer range forecasts. The latest one is out and senior economist Tim Hampton is with me in the studio to discuss. Tim, welcome to the programme. Thank you very much. Now, commodity prices may have peaked and I notice Marius Kloppers is talking about them coming off even further, but there's quite a long tail to this commodities boom, isn't there? Yeah, there's, there's many parts to this. Commodity prices have come off their highs by quite a chunk, but they're still very high relative to history, and all of the investment projects that have been undertaken are still very profitable. And there's currently another big round of investment projects underway, and so what we do know is that mining investment's going to keep growing for the next couple of years, and then probably hold there for a year or two. Where the uncertainty is, 
is whether the third round of mining investment comes through. And those are the kinds of projects that have been talked about in the media recently. And what, what uh, period is that, that third round? So that would be the activity that's taking place in the second half of this decade, so 2016 onwards. Yeah. Now in the meantime, uh, what are the other areas, non-mining areas, that are likely to pick up and, and why? Yeah. So a couple of areas that have been very weak for a long time are dwelling building activity and non-residential building due to lack of demand, difficult funding conditions and just generally low confidence. There hasn't been a lot of building. In fact, dwelling investment's gone sideways since 2004 in Australia. Mm. At the same time, though, we've had very strong population growth, and particularly here in New South Wales, we just haven't been building enough houses. So what we're looking for is that late this year, early next year, the current low level of interest rates will gradually stimulate that building activity, which is long overdue. That will then stimulate activity for accountants and uh, planners and real estate agents, mm. all those people that haven't been doing a lot of work lately. They'll be getting in doing a lot of planning, and that, then they'll be. That's quite optimistic in terms of a turnaround, because I mean, it's quite presumably it's quite dependent on the euro crisis and, and confidence generally. It is. Uh, interest rates are currently low, and. Uh, and that's, that's going to provide an important support. I guess the thing that's happening is I think everyone's just generally becoming a bit immune to the latest round of negative news coming, coming out of Europe. Oh, I, know, I know the media is. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I just don't think that, absent a very big crunch, that that's going to be enough to hold back the building activity. You talked about uh, growth in population. I guess the other thing is in terms of the, 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 the industries that are going to be coming forward as the mining boom does tail off, where, where are we going to see activity? So one of those is that is the building industries that, that mm. I talked about. But as, as we just looked at, that the services industries, particularly in health, is going to be an area that's going to continue to grow and expand as a, as a share, of the, share of the economy. Mm. And they, they are going to have spillover benefits into, again, it's, there's always going to be this need for these professional services and that sort of stuff. We're always going to need somewhere to live. We're always going to need somewhere to eat don't know what it is that we'll be wearing or what we'll be driving, and chances are it won't be made in Australia, but the people serving us each day, that's got to be done here in Australia, and so having the skills to meet that will be important. Now, when it comes to government, public infrastructure spending, that's, uh, that, that is that uh, is slower in terms, to, in terms of uh, when it actually starts reviving itself again, and I guess that's due to governments getting their, their, their budgets back in, on track. Yeah, and, and that's, personally I see that as, as being a big, a big worry. Mm. We're seeing a big crunch for, on the federal budget, and where they're making a lot of their savings is by reducing the amount of money that they're giving to the states, who are the ones that do the infrastructure spending. And so we're looking at another two to three years of declines in infrastructure spending. And there's a real risk that we'll have exactly what we had in the 1990s, when infrastructure spending was scaled back significantly. You ended up with these big infrastructure bottlenecks, and it really slowed down the economy, and it took about 10 years of investment to catch up. And I think it would be a mistake to do that again. Unfortunately, it looks like what the government is doing this time. Mm, we will keep an eye on infrastructure. Very interesting area. Tim Hampton, thank you very much. Thank you.